Something big is going on in the markets. The S&P 500 put out a red day today, but diving deeper under the hood, things are starting to unravel. The leaders of today's rally was consumer defensives, and oftentimes when staple leads, the next six months tend to see very lackluster returns and even negative performance outcomes. So is the market sending us a warning? Today, we're going to discuss that and inflation, and more importantly, how the consumer is holding up in light of all of this. There are some good data points, there are some bad data points, and today we're going to weigh the two to see which one has greater importance. We're also going to be diving into earnings and what fund managers are doing in light of recent outcomes. Are fund managers getting bullish or are they getting bearish? We've got a lot to talk about, but let's roll the tape. Welcome everybody to the daily recap show where we welcome everybody to the daily recap show where we talk about stocks and the financial markets. My name is Chase. If you like this video, please subscribe, hit that notification bell, like this video and leave a comment for the algorithm. We're trying to get 10,000 subscribers here in May, so go ahead and subscribe. Let's get into it. This is the daily heat map of the S&P 500 and it was bound to happen. I think something like nine or 10 days later, we finally have our first red day here in the S&P 500. But it was a very, very interesting day. Firstly, if you go here to insurance, right, the subsector in financials, they did really, really well on the back of Warren Buffett buying Chubb Security. A bunch of 13 Fs got released from these major investment firms and Warren Buffett and Berkshire bought Chubb Security. They have a $6 billion position in there you can see the stock was up four percent it helped the entire insurance space as a whole and in fact it's probably part of the reason why we saw a little bit of upbeat action relative to the market here in financials we saw consumer defensives outperform as well on walmart's earnings so walmart uh, posted really good earnings raised guidance and as a result the entire consumer staple sector really just rallied on the back of that but excluding that some stocks were green some stocks were red it was really a mixed bag like for example here in technology we had microsoft was red apple was flat some of the smaller names were really really green intel amd nvidia was flat on the day then like in comp services meta was down Google was up, you know, in consumer cyclicals, Amazon was down, Tesla was up, a very mixed day on the market, but all in all, a red day across the board, but nothing too crazy. You could see uh, staples outperform by a wide margin. And this goes to the defensive debate that we've been having with XLU. A lot of people saying XLU leading the rally for the last couple of weeks, even last couple of months is a bad thing. But the truth is the sector is growing their earnings by 26% year over year and that tends to happen these are stocks they rally when earnings coming good we saw that with walmart today defensive sectors cyclical sectors sensitive sectors it does not matter earnings is the tide that lifts all boats we then saw financials like i said before you know finish flat for the day they didn't gain or lose. Then every other sector did lose today. It was only XLC, XLV, XLRE that beat the SPY. Every other sector underperformed the SPY with the worst performing sector being semiconductors, materials, and gold miners. And for the most part, you have a look right here. Gold miners was actually the worst performing sector at the start of the day. And part, a lot of the losses. And we're going to talk about why on the charts. So let's go hop on the charts really, really quickly. Before we dive into the S&P 500 daily analysis, let's actually have a look at what we did on the day. So the, the, the SPY down 0.21%, same with the NASDAQ, the Dow Jones 0.1%. And I do believe Walmart is in the Dow Jones. And that's why we saw a little bit of upbeat action there. The RSP uh, down 0.16. So, you know, across the board, uh, it was a fairly uh, mixed day and a fairly red day. But what really hit, got hit the hardest was mid caps here. The S&P 600 down point. 37% the IWM but these uh, three sectors have outperformed the S&P 500 and these larger indexes in the last couple of days so it's only fair that they pull back quite a bit growth underperformed value so today was a day for value and this just goes to show why you should probably have a little bit of value allocation in your portfolio but we can see a little bit of upbeat action here in the after hours so this dip is probably going to get bought I wouldn't even call it a dip just a minor pullback you can see look at the US 500 the US 100 so the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq up 0.9.1 percent but it's still early days the vix did fall ever so slightly what did yields do on the day let's have a look so we saw a slight pop in yields up 0.71 percent that's actually a pretty big move uh for the yields as a whole uh we actually saw that in the long end as well yields actually did gap down quite a bit there's quite a bit of a wick here so you know buyers did step up in a very very big way and i think that's probably why we saw a little bit of weakness in names such as home construction but we didn't see bonds do a whole lot bitcoin down 1.25 percent here today and essentially we have this massive trend line here in bitcoin as you can see and it's exactly what normally happens when we break above a trend line we normally pull back to this trend line 
We want to use it as support and then see if the rally ensues. So, you know, very critical moment here for the Bitcoin bros. They're either going to use a support, right? And then move higher in Bitcoin or they're going to break below this line. It's going to be used as resistance, go down. And then if they make another lower low below this point right here, it's probably on the way to 52,000. So big moment for the Bitcoin bros. They really have to, in the next couple of days, early next week, really get moving in taking Bitcoin to the upside if they want higher price action. Looking at gold at the moment, let's have a look. Not doing much kind of trading here at all time highs. Not quite an all time high close, but very, very close nonetheless. And not even that oversold here on the RSI. So it's very, very interesting that gold probably can move higher. And I do think we probably are going to go ahead and hit a new all time high there for gold. I mean, if you're that close, may as well. Markets tend to do that. Silver, all time high. Very, very interesting. All time high close bullish probably go higher for silver it has underperformed gold for the most part in the last 10 years that's to be expected we're gonna actually see commodities are actually a little bit upbeat here in the after hours particularly silver then we had the dollar did gain ever so slightly that's probably why we saw stocks uh, come under pressure a little bit here today it actually gained quite a lot 0.2 percent that's a big move for the dollar and then we had crude oil still you know in this sideways movement right here forming a base and you know normally when you form a base like this it either leads to a big move to the upside or big move to the downside but let's dive into the s p 500 and you can see just based on the rsi part of the reason why we actually did pull back here today even though we did gap down and we did rally to a new all-time high in the s p 500 is that we just were getting to like overbought conditions you know, we weren't quite overbought in this rally to the upside right here. And, you know, we sort of hit this overbought 70 zone. We, ha we had a little bit of a pullback. Now, we are making gains here in the after hours, and that's completely OK. And we are still in a technical uptrend. I mean, let's pull up the weekly chart. I know the week's not done, but you can see like on the weekly chart, you know, we're putting a low right here. And we keep making higher lows all the way where we made a higher low right here. And we've actually made highs and an all time high on the daily chart and the weekly chart. So so this is bullish, guys. You do want to be buyers of dips in a market like this. Now, hopping on the daily chart, right? We can actually see a very similar situation. Nothing changes between the daily and the weekly. Now, our key areas of support in the S&P 500 continue to be the 5300 core gamma resistance and the 5200 gamma flip zone. Those are our options levels and and generally speaking, they're the levels that we want to look at. So you know, the first level is actually 5200. Now 5200 is key because it's our gamma flip zone. Below this area right here, we're in negative gamma. We can actually see quite volatile movement. Above here, we're actually in positive gamma. And this does offer a very, very strong area of support. Another reason why we actually did pull back here today is because at the 5300 level right here, okay, that is our all gamma resistance. It's a very, very strong resistance line. And yeah, we did break above it for sure, but we actually did close below it. We did find resistance in this area. It's not an exact science. It's sort of around the area. And that's exactly what happened. So what do I think is going to happen into OPEX tomorrow? I don't think we're going to see a massive move in the options market. I think we're probably just going to keep trending sideways here, maybe make a new all time high and then close pretty much where we are. I think we're going to have a very flat day. Options expiry days tend to be pretty flat nonetheless. And we have had an exceptional week here. We opened the week right here. We're up 1.2% so far for the week. And we have one more day of trade. Don't think we're going to finish uh, negative for the week. I think we're going to have a very positive week and you know any any week where you gain 1.2 percent you want to take that so you know the game plan is still the same we want to be buyers of dips all the way to the 5200 area this is the gamma flip zone we will find support here and then we want to look for higher price action and that price action is all time highs at the same time here at the 5300 but we don't want to bet short on anything we're not we might not get to the 5200 we could find support anywhere in this area especially as we exit opex week and go into the window of weakness you know you should already be long and the game plan here right now is just to hold your long hold exposure there's no point in getting into the s p 500 right here right now especially if you're a short-term trader looking six to twelve months out you got 10 years go for it but right now you just want to hold the longs you have there's and buy dips all the way to 5200 because we probably are going higher. I think we're going to see 5384. That is my price target. And that's what I expect the S&P 500 to do in the next couple of weeks. So onward and upward, we are going higher, but do expect a bit of digestion as we ex as we move into the window of weakness.
All right, guys, looking at sentiment, there's been virtually no change to last week here in the double A double I sentiment survey. Bullish sentiment votes at 40%, neutral at about 35%. The bear is still sitting at 23.3%. So it seems like this is kind of where market equilibrium is right now, at least in a bull market, sort of like this 38 to 40% range in bullish sentiment votes, 35% here in neutral votes and then bearish votes sitting at 23%. And while these two are kind of near the historical averages, as you can see, bullish sentiment votes are well off the historic highs or lows, however you want to look at it. Either way, this tells us that sentiment is still bullish and in a market with bullish sentiment, you do want to hold equities, you do want exposure. Another sentiment reading we're seeing is massive upgrades across the board. The latest company to do so is BMO Capital. They upgraded their price target to 5,600. Normally guys, when you see this type of chasing, this often does mean that we're near an interim top. We saw this in 2021 with massive price targets before we absolutely dumped. Now, I'm not saying we're going to dump. I'm just saying that this is the type of stuff that you often see near tops. And you know, a bunch of these have upgraded all of their price targets in the last month or so. All of these guys, you know, throughout 2023, except except for a few were very, very bearish. And into 2024, their price targets were very close to 5,000. Pretty much all of them. I think one strat had the highest on the street in January, excluding myself. Mine was 53.84. One strat had the highest in January at 5,200. Everybody thought this was crazy. Now we're seeing 5,600. Absolutely nutty price targets here in the S&P 500. But it is what it is. And We'll see if 5600 materializes. I will revise my price target when we get to 5384. Until that day, I'm sticking to my price target. But let's look at some other sentiment measures. Now, this is something I showed you at the start of May, guys. It's essentially what happens during a turn of year hat trick following its first negative month. So it, the turn of the year hat trick is when we have a positive December, January, and February, and we have the first negative month like we did in April. And what happens one month, three months, six months later, you can see normally what follows is very positive average returns. 2.54% one month later, 4.1% three months later, 5.58% six months later, and fairly high win rates, 21 and four, 20 and five, 22 and three. And that's why we're sort of seeing this rally in May. You know, this turn of the year hat trick is normally a very, very bullish signal. We normally get a pullback in the first negative month, and then we just continue the rally one month, three months, and six months on. And that's just the thing in bull markets. When you do get a weak month, you normally want to buy the dip because normally momentum brings momentum. And when you get a little bit of a dip, you want to take advantage as quickly as possible because the rallies normally ensue to the upside very, very quickly. And this is exactly what we saw here in the month of May and we will probably see throughout the rest of 2024. Now, May has been insanely bullish. What have FMS investors been doing with their portfolios? Now, this right here is the month over month percentage point change in FMS investor positioning. Now, you can actually see that month over month, fund managers were actually embracing for what I believe was a deeper drawdown than that 5 to 6% garden variety pullback we actually saw. And this is actually kind of true because look at what they were holding. FMS investors were building cash in their portfolios. They were buying staples, bonds, telcoms. These are all very, very defensive sectors. And then you can see equities right here. And I'm assuming this basket of equities are really consisted of stuff like uh, utilities, telecoms, staples. They were also buying stuff like UK stocks, right? Which is value as well as healthcare. Again, another defensive sector. And these were the main ones, you know, like one, two, three, four, five. It was sort of like equities. I'm going to remove this right here. Sort of like UK telecoms, bonds, staples, and cash. So some of these fund managers may have been caught offside, but it's not like they actually decreased their exposure to US or technology or commodities or banks as a whole. They actually kept them relatively flat. They were just like rotating into cash into some of these more defensive sectors. And that's generally what fund managers do. They're there to manage risk in times when they do expect a pullback but the markets are looking a bit weak from a breadth perspective you do have to rotate into these defensive sectors just from a capital preservation standpoint because essentially that's what you're paying them to do you're not managing risk yourself you're paying them to manage risk that being said in the last month we've seen investors sell REITs industrials the eurozone utilities insurance and Japan and then you know the rest 
So guys, let's talk a bit about earnings. So we had quite the day today. We had Canada Goose. I think they reported a double beat. Not sure what it did after hours. I did see Under Armour's earnings, a complete dumpster fire. They were down like 15% in the pre-market. The segment here is recorded in the pre-market. John Deere was down about 5%. JD was up about 1% in the pre-market. So not great earnings there from John Deere. All right from JD. Baidu was pretty good. And now we're actually going to have a look at Walmart. Now, Walmart was up 5.5% in the pre-market trading. And that's because it came off a double beat. It beat EPS of 52 cents by reporting 60 cents in earnings per share. And that was on sales of $161.5 billion versus the market expectation of $158 billion. So earnings looking really good for Walmart. It seems like the consumer is holding in there because the market really liked this earnings. The stock is pretty flat for the year when the S&P 500 is up close to 10%. So, you know, Walmart's probably going to play a bit of catch up. It's always good to see a bit of a strength in the pre-market if the company reports beforehand or in the after hours. You know, that does show a little bit of a vote of confidence. That being said, really good earnings here from Walmart. And I believe they kept guidance very, very similar, a slight, slight raise, but inconsequential. And that's why we did see quite upbeat movement here in the in pre-market trading. And to be honest, up 5.77% when this earnings season stocks have been beaten down a lot is actually really, really good. So great earnings here from Walmart. Now looking at the earnings scorecard, very interesting. So again, until we actually get the bigger names reporting a little bit next week, like Costco, Adobe, NVIDIA, this is not going to change much. We've had 424 companies report 7.8% earnings growth here in the S&P 500, 10.9% excluding energy and this BMY adjustment. Now, the best performing sector on an earnings basis is comm services, followed by technology and then utilities. Now, a lot of people were saying utilities is quote unquote sending a warning. The truth is utilities are just growing their earnings significantly and also with revenue down 6%. This means they're finding a ton of operating leverage in their books somewhere. This is why investors are looking at utilities because when this changes, you're actually going to see a remarkable change in earnings as well. Now on a revenue front, the best performing sector is actually financials and technology. Actually have a look at real estate plus 7.4%, still a very, very hated sector and 10.5% earnings. But we do know that real estate earnings is coming off some very, very easy comps. The worst performing sectors on a revenue new standpoint is materials, energy, and utilities. And then on an earnings perspective, healthcare, energy, and materials. All in all, it's been a great earnings season so far because at the start of earnings season, we were expecting 3.5% revenue growth and earnings growth. We've actually beaten those by a large margin in aggregate, despite all of the red we've seen right here and right here. Earnings season is coming in really, really good. And stocks are just priced to perfection heading into this earnings season. We have had a pullback. We've had a bit of a digestion period. That's really good for stocks. The onward and upward from here. The fundamental picture looks very, very healthy in my opinion. Okay, let's talk a bit about the economy. The Fed GDP now estimate still very, very elevated. We're looking at a GDP estimate here of about 3.8, maybe 3.9%. This is the Fed's GDP now. They just aggregate a bunch of economic figures that they get in real time and form a GDP figure. So 3.8% quite elevated, a lot higher than the blue chip consensus, which is pretty much just the big banks and investment houses, research firms giving their prediction. And they see GDP for the second quarter, 2024, coming in at 2%. So a big divergence right here. We've actually seen the Fed's GDP now figure has actually come a lot closer than the blue chip consensus in the last four to five quarters. So just some data here that, you know, for the most part, growth is tracking quite high relative to inflation as a whole. Now, we're actually going to have a look at the consumer finance dashboard here from both are very, very interesting. Now, you look at all of this, you see some red, you see some green, we will say things are very mixed. But if you actually dive into the weeds, it's actually not as bad as it looks. Now, the unemployment rate, 3.9% right here, up 50 basis points year over year. But that comes with rate hikes and actually 3.9% still an historically low level. Non-farms, year over year change up 1.8%. But we do know that the non-farms figure last month was lighter than usual. But we've We've actually seen very, very strong non-farms in this year, in the last three to four months. So this is also a really good thing, a positive. Then we actually have a look at average hourly earnings. Wage inflation has actually come down on a year over year basis and month over month basis. So it's part of the reason why inflation was remaining sticky, part of the reason why CPI is coming down. But then we also see personal income is 
up. So wage inflation is decreasing, but personal income is higher. And that has to do with disinflationary forces, as well as a bunch of other stuff. What's also very, very interesting is new bankruptcy cases, right? Zero percent. So zero percent year over year change. But we also do know that business filings have actually soared here in 2023 and 2024. So on a real return basis, I guess you could call it that zero percent would actually mark a decrease relative to the amount of uh, new business formings or new business filings filings in this year. Then we look at some other spending readings, consumer confidence up 21.2% year over year, but actually down last month, consumer confidence did wane on a month over month basis. And all in all, when you dive into the weeds right here for all of this stuff, I would say the consumer remains quite robust when you look at everything in aggregate. Now let's dive into a bit of inflation. This is a very interesting chart. This is the Federal Reserve's now cast model. So it uses GDP now as well as CPI now, quarter over quarter and the latest CPI figure. So we can actually see uh, the GDP sitting at 3.7%. CPI sitting at 3.37%, fairly healthy. Now in 2021 into 2022, this was a stagflationary period. Part of the reason why we got rate cuts, you can actually see that CPI was very, very high at one point double digit CPI growth right here and GDP, very low GDP growth. This does not look like inflation. And in fact, this actually looks like a, a strong economy, you know, inflation coming down. You can see general disinflation while growth for the most part has sort of ticked up here in GDP. That's actually what you want to see in a very, very healthy economy. What we normally want to see is this uh, inflation figure get to that 2% mark, growth to remain where it is, you know, anywhere from 2 to 3%. Maybe it's a bit high relative to the amount of fiscal and monetary easing in the system. But from what I see, this looks fairly robust and we're on the right track here. And it doesn't quite feel like stagflation that was on everybody's lips just a couple of weeks ago. Now, looking at inflation and what to expect for the rest of the year. So this right here is scenarios for PCE. That's the next inflation print we're going to get. And pretty much this is where we are right now, this black line right here. And so if we're to get 0.05% month over month through the rest of the year, 0 0.2, 0 0.25, 0 0.3, this is where inflation will end up. So at 0.5%, we'll actually see disinflation for the rest of the year. If we're to get 0.2% per month, inflation PCE will actually move lower, but then move up towards the end of the year, as you can see. And then 0.25, 0 0.3%, that's definitely what we don't want for the inflation readings. And if that is the case, we will see inflation reaccelerate in a very, very big way into the end of the year, which can actually spook equity markets. So what we want for the market right now is core PCE deflation. But if we don't get that deflation, we want to stay in between 0.15%. 0.2% per month. If we see 0.5 and 0.2% per month, we probably will see the implied policy rate differential move down. And that means we're probably getting more rate cuts on the table. But if we get 0.25, 0.3%, we're actually going to see this move up into no rate cut territory. But with the latest CPI data print we just got yesterday, if that trend was to continue, it probably means we move lower into this area right here and price in more rate cuts into the system. Right now, we're probably looking at one to two rate cuts. If the data continues to come in soft, we're probably going to look at two to three rate cuts. And that would be probably 75 to 100 basis points worth of cuts through to the end of the year 2024. Looking at gamma really quick, guys, nothing has really changed. The gamma flip is still 5,200 right here. So look, we're if we do sell off to this 5200 area, if we do pull back, we're buying dips at this 5200 area. It's going to offer strong support. And look, guys, there's not a lot of negative gamma below it. So I don't think we're going to go below it. Normally, these gamma levels act as magnets. And if there's just not a lot of negative gamma, you know, we're not really going to move there. So if we do pull back, you know, this week into next week, we'll get 5200 or 5195 as, you know, a strong support zone. Other than that, you know, we're 5300 is the call resistance. Once a lot of this uh, gamma rolls off the tape, I'm sure we're probably going to move the call gamma resistance up to this 5300 tape. We can also see if we actually look at the JEX, VEX, and DEX profiles, so the Delta exposure, Vanna exposure profiles, you can actually see they're all in positive territory right here, particularly the Vanna and Delta exposure profiles. So everything's looking really, really good for the market just to buy dips if we do get them and sell rips 
on the way up. But what we really want to look for now into this OPEX, into Friday, into next week, is where does the call resistance reposition itself? Does it stay at the 5300 come Monday or does it move up the tape? Moving up would be incredibly bullish. Staying where it is probably means that we're going to trend sideways for the rest of May in the window of weakness. So we really want to see that move up for more upside action. However, if we do start at the 5300, it probably means we're going to go through about two weeks of a digestive phase where we might trade up to like 5350 down to like 5250, you know, inside a 100, 150 point range uh, towards the end of May into June after what has been quite a remarkable rally from about the 5000 level, you know, 300 points up to the 5300 level. So looking at market breadth, guys, this is a bull market. This is 100% a bull market. Look at the five day moving average, 10 day, 20, 50, 100, 150, 200, 250 day moving average of so pretty much a year. And this is, are they above that or are they below it? And every single major index at every single major moving average is above the S&P 500, NASDAQ Composite, Russell 3000, Russell 2000. All of these are all above their moving averages. And this is what you see in a bull market. In a bull market, everything rallies and we are still in the process of not just small caps rallying, not just large caps rallying, everything as a whole is on the up and up. At the same time, we are seeing strong leadership. The core leadership model has officially gone from the zero area right here into strong leadership. Now, this is not a reason to short. This isn't a oversold or overbought territory. This is saying market leadership right now is strong and you want to be long in a strong leadership regime. It often coincides with huge melt ups in equity markets. And this is what we're starting to see um, right here. And this is very, very good. And when we do get pullbacks into weak leadership, this should just be looked at as dip buying opportunities. And guys, at the same time, the number of S&P 500 all time highs this year has reached 23. You can see that normally we go on long stretches where we don't get all time highs like we did in the early 2000s after 2008. But when we do make all time highs, we tend to go on massive, massive stretches. Here in 2021, we had 70 new all time highs. We can see like we did most of the 90s right here through the 50s and 60s as well. And we're sort of doing the same. We didn't make any in 2023. We made one in 2022 at the start of 2022. And now we're back to new all time highs. And hopefully we can go on a four or five year run of just continuous new all time highs in the S&P 500. That would be very, very good for investors long term and investor confidence. Now, with regards to this bull market, can we continue to get those new all time highs? And the answer is yes, because this is just a list of all cyclical bull markets, essentially you know, in the bear market, when we've trothed, what's essentially happened. This dark line right here is us right now. And you can see that our bull market is sort of at the halfway phase and it's tracking not at the high end, pretty much at the low end. So it's actually quite a weak bull market, despite all of the strength we've seen. This probably leaves a lot more room for upside in the S&P 500. I know a lot of people quote valuations and that sort of thing, but you know, the composition of the index was far different than it was in 87, 1994, 1966. I think stocks are, and businesses are far higher quality right now. Pretty much just tells us that there is still a lot of room left to the upside. If we do get higher price action in the S&P 500 that blows the socks off everybody, we shouldn't be surprised that tends to happen in the market. Lastly, looking at liquidity conditions, guys, we officially are above the zero line. I showed you guys this last week. And in fact, I showed you guys this when we were right here at the bottom and we have since bottomed out quite significantly. We've gone above the bid area. We're now in turbo bid and that's exactly what we're seeing. We're seeing this massive amounts of liquidity come into the system with disinflationary forces. That is bullish. And now I do expect this to pull back just a little bit and then we continue in this liquidity zone. Now, once we get into this turbo bid area, we don't normally go much higher. This means there's a lot of liquidity in the system and coming into the system. But you see, we don't normally trade above the zone quite a lot. So if we do like pull back into this bid area, that's completely normal. And that will coincide with the S&P 500, maybe pulling back maybe 1% half a percent, maybe having a couple of red days, market can't go up forever, but there still is excess liquidity in the system. And that is always a tailwind for stocks. But if you've made it up until here, thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please subscribe, like this video and hit that notification bell and leave a comment for the algorithm. Cheers.